and welcome to the uh, Board of Education meeting. This is the board of, regular Board of Education meeting for Monday, February 26, 2018. And nice to see so many interested uh, citizens out in the audience tonight. So hopefully uh, uh, we, we're, we're planning on having a good meeting here tonight. Uh, it's been a busy day, as you can just about uh, imagine. And uh, we have a, a lot on the agenda. And so we're going to get moving right or jump right into it here. And uh, again, because we have a lot on the agenda and we need to get moving. So, see the board is ready to go here and everyone's looking chipper. It's been a busy day, so let's get started. Uh, first item on the agenda is the recitation of the vision statement, which is every school will be a thriving school that prepares every student to graduate from high school, college, career, and community ready. And we'll move right into our recognition uh, resolutions. And uh, the Board of Education, make sure I got them all right here. The Board of Education will recognize The Board of Education will recognize um, the NWACP Africa, Africa, friend, Afro Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympians. Okay, well, two of our bright La Follette high school seniors. Amadou Cromar and Janae Harris competed in the NAACP's Afro-Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics this past year in 2017. Now, Amadou won the silver medal in the photography competition, and Janae was selected as one of 12 students nationwide to participate in the poetry performance, which allowed her to interact with NAACP Image Award nominees and winners. Uh, and both are here on the stage. Okay, I'd like to uh, take this moment to read the resolution, please. Um, for over 30 years, the NAACP has conducted the ACT EXO Student Olympics, which also helps to prepare, recognize, and reward African American youth who exemplify scholastic and artistic excellence. Now, the Madison Metropolitan School District Board of Education would like to recognize Amadou and Janae's accomplishments. Now, whereas Two La Follette High School seniors competed in the NAACP's Afro Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics, whereas through the, this competition, Amadou and Janae Harris spent many grueling hours preparing for their ongoing competition with guidance from the NAACP AXO chairperson, Francis Huntley Cooper, whereas the NAACP's Afro Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics are a year-long achievement program designed to recruit, stimulate, and encourage high academic and cultural achievement among African-American high school students. Whereas the Olympics consist of 32 competitions in STEM, humanities, business, and performing visual and culinary arts. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Madison Metropolitan School District Board of Education recognizes and congratulates Amadou, Janae, and Francis for their ongoing achievements. Now, be it further resolved, this statement be permanently imprinted in the Board of Education Minutes for the meeting of February 26, 2018. So again, many congratulations to both students, and we hope that both of you keep up your great work moving forward.
And our second resolution today is, uh, pardon? Are we going to do public appearances first? Hold on. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I see it. Okay. All right. I got you now. Now I have you. Okay. Boy, things are stacked here today. Okay. Next item on the agenda will be public comments. And so we do have uh, quite a few people wanting to speak today. So I want to remind everyone of the rules and guidelines for speaking. You do have three minutes, and we do have quite a few people that want to speak, so I'm pleading with you to really stay within your guidelines of three minutes. And uh, what I will do, I'll call up a speaker, and I'll call up two at a time, so please, the second speaker, uh, be on the way to the podium so that we can move here quickly as possible. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, uh, the indicator that your three minutes will be up will be you will hear the timer, the beeper go off on the timer. So that will be your indicator. So we'll get started on the public speaking section today. And our first speaker will be Lynn Poster. And Lynn would be followed by Gracie DeBurrow. Lynn Poster, followed by Gracie DeBurrow. I'm a proud parent of a freshman at La Follette and a sixth grader at Senate. My husband and myself have lived in Madison our whole lives. My husband went to East and I myself went to La Follette. I myself actually work in the Madison schools. I am a behavior education assistant at Kennedy Elementary. I have one question for the board. Why would we allow a student, whether they're a regular student, a special ed student, or a 504 plan student, who brought in first a BB gun to school, and most recently a 22 caliber handgun to school, why would we allow the student, why would you allow the student to come back into La Follette without proper support for the school, extra mental health support, and beyond. It is my understanding that no matter what the principal wants, it's up to the board to decide this, and if the student should come back. And if he, comes, he or she comes back, the district is not required to provide any extra support for this student at this school. That is my question, and I, that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, Gracie, before you start, I'm going to uh, exercise uh, presidential discretion here. Um, Lynn, you will begin to answer to that question soon. Uh, unfortunately, that question has been on the table far too long, and the answer is forthcoming. Okay, Gracie, please start. Um, hello, my name is Gracie DeBrew. I'm an 18-year-old senior at La Follette High School. I'm the daughter of a police officer and an educator. Recent events, both nationally and locally, have put the spotlight back on school security and the way that we deal with threats. Following a recent incident at La Follette where a student brought a gun to school, some of my peers and I met with our principal, Sean Storch. My understanding from what I was told at this meeting is that these types of situations are not treated as a threat until they're proven to be a threat. If we want to prevent harm to our students, we have to treat these potential threats as real, as real threats until proven otherwise, and police should investigate these situations immediately. During the meeting, we also discussed how the student with the gun was allowed to re-enter the building because another student let them in. I've observed this happening multiple times a, um, a day, as have my peers. As students, we're reminded often that doing this is a suspendable offense, but according to what I was told at the meeting, only 15 students have been suspended when this happens hundreds of times a week, hundreds. 
This issue is not being taken seriously by the students or staff. I realize that there's no simple way to fix this, but there are things that can be done to help improve door security. If these infractions were taken more seriously and students knew they'd face consequences for this, the frequency of these infractions would go down. During the recent gun incident, the student was not only let back into the building, but they were able to walk to an office located in the middle of the school. From, from the time they entered the school to the time they were confronted, we were informed that four minutes had elapsed. The average school shooting in the United States lasts three minutes. Fortunately, this student didn't make the decision to use the weapon. Imagine what could have happened if they did. At the meeting, we were told that the student who brought the gun into school last week had previously committed a similar offense. I wonder, why was this student allowed back into the hallways of La Follette High School after the first time? This situation also brought to, the, to mind the inability of our school to be properly locked down. Our classroom doors only have external locks, which means that someone would need to go in the hallway to lock the door in a lockdown situation. In my opinion, we need to be able to lock our doors from the inside. Our procedures are outdated. We need to update them so that when class is in session, doors are locked and closed from the inside. Remember, the average school shooting in the US takes three minutes from when the first shot is fired. If an active shooter comes into the school and enters one classroom, even if every other door in the school gets locked after the shooting starts, every child in that one classroom is a potential victim. This is unacceptable, but a very simple fix. My goal in speaking to you today is not to point fingers, but to bring attention to these issues and to change the way the district prioritizes safety and security in our schools. Some things, such as changes to procedures and policies, are simple to implement and have little to no cost. Others have varying costs associated with them, such as better entry control systems, metal detectors, and other physical security improvements. You need to finish up, please. I urge you to take action on these issues now and before something bad happens here in one of our Madison schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, audience, audience, this is a board meeting and I know you're, you're pleased with the presentations, but we need to keep moving quickly, so I'm gonna ask you to hold your applause, please. Typically, we don't have applause at the board meeting. Calista Stark, followed by Tara Della Barry, Celista Stark, Hi, I'm Calista Stork. I'm 17 years old and I go to Follett High School. And I'm here to talk about something that's been on my mind for a while and I finally have the balls to say it. Sorry for the language. Um, when I was 14 years old, I was sexually abused by a security officer at my middle school. And he's now at another Madison High School. And I'm here to ask why current policies we have currently protect the staffers more than me. We've been pursuing legal action for the last four years and nothing's been done to protect me. Um, and after those four years, I regret to say that literally nothing's been done. Um, and I know that safety is a top priority right now, but how can you expect to protect us from outside forces when you fail to protect us from those who are supposed to keep us safe in schools, those forces that are inside? Um, these are the people we're supposed to trust the most, and I've lost almost all of my trust in them. When did reputation become more of a priority than the safety and the well-being of the students? I am asking for policy that favors the safety of the children, the safety of me. And I recognize how valuable and amazing our teachers are and I want them to be supported and I want them to feel safe in schools too, but I don't feel safe. And schools are about feeling safe and schools are about forming relationships with teachers, but when I'm scared of forming relationships with teachers because I know that if something happens, I'm not protected, how do I go to school every day? And I'm here to say, all in all, that I have been failed by the district. And the longer that you uphold these policies protecting faculty to is harmful to students, the longer that you are failing your students and me. And I've been here since kindergarten and I loved going to school. I went to Kennedy, that was amazing. I went to Whitehorse, and that's when things went south. And 
it's hard going to school every day knowing that the people I used to look up to and trust the most aren't there for me. So I'm just asking that policy be looked at when it comes to protecting students and looking more closely at Title IX and having better Title IX coordination within schools. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I, this is hard to read. Is it Tara Delabar? Tara Delabar. Okay, they're closed. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> I am a parent of a junior at La Follette High School. Um, this is the first time I've done anything like this, so I'm not really sure how it works. But I do actually have a direct question for Kate. Um, last year, when you were running for school board, um, you had said that um, for Madison to become a leader, um, that they needed to make a greater investment in creating better working environments for teachers. You also stated that you wanted Madison to be one of the most desirable places for teachers to work. Um, you wanted to support them in all ways so that they could do what they do best, and that's teach. Do you think that the BEP is creating a desirable workplace for teachers currently? And do you think the board is doing everything they can to support the teachers? Oh, this is not an interaction. And that's fine. I just want to get my question out there and have somebody think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Cal Baker, followed by David Mullen. I had a couple of uh, handouts and a sample for the, for the board to look at. Good evening. Um, my name is Kyle Baker. I'm a Madison resident. Um, I've lived here for about five years. And while I don't have any kids in the school system yet, um, I will at some point in the near future. And, the reason for me speaking to the board tonight is uh, my brother-in-law, um, who's located in Muscatine, Iowa, um, started a business about four and a half years ago called Fighting Chance Solutions. Um, this is a business uh, by educators, for educators, and it's uh, an invention called the sleeve, which is designed specifically for uh, active shooter situations. Um, basically, the business was born out of, you know, unsatisfactory, um, you know, results from active shooter training, whether it be barricading the door, tying your belt um, around the door, uh, closer, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, the invention was born out of trying to find a better solution for active shooter scenarios. Um, currently, the invention is in all 50 states, military bases, hospitals, um, and it can be used in conjunction with interior door locks, or it can be used um, on its own. Um, it actually prevented an active entry during a shooting uh, at the UCLA shooting um, and kept out uh, an intruder to a room. So it's been tried, tested, proven, um, and like I said, it's, uh, it's been implemented across the country. Um, so basically, my reason for talking tonight to the board uh, is to just let them know that, number one, the product is out there. Um, you know, it's been tested, um, it's been implemented, it's, you know, proven itself uh, in the moment when it needed to most. And I think the, the great part about it, like I said, it's you know, made by teachers. Uh, it's made here in America. Um, and the great part is, is it's relatively cheap to implement. Um, you know, you can buy them, they can ship next day, uh, and, and teachers can have them on their door um, in a matter of days. So it's, you know, when you start talking about rolling out programs for, you know, door locks and you talk about you know, keys and things of this nature. Um, this is a product that can be in any classroom. Um, substitute teachers have access to them. You know, traveling from room to room, uh, teachers uh, also have access to them as well. So, uh, and it takes about, I mean, if you have it somewhere in your close vicinity in the classroom, I mean, it can be put on in a matter of seconds. So, real quick to e implement, very easy, straightforward, um, and, you know, in, in a high stress situation, um, you want quickness, ease, um, and dependability, uh, which is given by the product. Um, so oh, anyway, thank you for your consideration, and uh, good evening. Thank you. Yes. David Mullen, followed by 
Gloria Rains. I have a senior at La Follette High School and a freshman at La Follette High School and also a seventh grader at Senate Middle School. We have over 30 student years uh, in the schools here. In the two and a half years that the BEP has been in place, the incidents of fights and behavioral incidents and so on at La Follette High School have not gone down, they've gone up. We're very concerned that the BEP is failing. It's failing the students that it was designed to serve. This very small number of kids that are at the heart of this problem, we had this conversation with Dr. Cheatham and Mr. Storch last week at La Follette High School. That small number of group, small number of kids that are at the heart of the problem are not being served. They have not in two and a half years learned how to better regulate their behavior. Instead, the behavior has worsened. And at the same time, it's also failing the vast majority of students who are at the school to take tests, to study, to go to class, doing what they're supposed to be doing, being in class, being on time. Their safety, their peace of mind is threatened by the behavior of the other kids. The BEP is failing both sets of kids, and it's time to revisit it and understand why is it not succeeding here, and how can we move forward instead. I'm concerned that the BEP is laying the groundwork for an atrocity like Parkwood to happen here in the city of Madison. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria Reigns, followed by David Velasco. Gloria Reyes, thank you. Um, so as a, as a parent, former police officer, and as a public safety professional, I am deeply concerned about the recent Florida Parkland shooting and the other social school shootings that have occurred just this year. I'm also equally concerned about the local threats and the incidents that have occurred, particularly in La Follette. Are we prepared? And how are we going to protect our children? Our questions that continue to keep, wake, keep me wake, awoke at night. And I know many parents and teachers are asking themselves the same question. We have concerned parents, students, staff, elected officials, and community advocating for stricter gun laws through mobilization to hold our elected officials responsible for not acting on legislation that will provide for stricter gun laws. Due to the accessibility of guns in our country, recent school shootings, and the combination of untreated behavioral health needs and other societal challenges bring us to the reality that our children are targets both inside and outside the classroom. We must continue to advocate to enact federal legislation to reduce the accessibility of firearms. In the meantime, what are we going to do to keep our children safe? We have learned from Parkland, Florida shooting that students, teachers, and staff had significant training on fire drills. However, the school shooter, the sc shooter pulled the fire alarm to get students to come out of the classrooms. When they heard the shots fired, they were trained on shelter-in-place procedures, trying to find places inside the classroom to hide and lock the doors. As a school district and community, we have to tackle this with a sense of urgency through a proactive multidisciplinary approach. Our schools can't do this alone. As a public safety professional, we should start by conducting a security assessment of where we are as a school district. That includes scenario-based training, infrastructure security measures, and overall planning on how we prepare ourselves for the active shooter. Comprehensive scenario-based training that is ongoing with students, teachers, staff, local public safety officials, EROs, and community and community, not only for active shooter incidents, but for how we handle other threats from arson to bullying to identifying suspicious behavior. We need to conduct school safety audit in every school helping to identify the school security snapshot that will help identify the vulnerabilities of each school, replacing locks, video surveillance, check-in check -in procedures. We need to review our security um, policies and procedures, mental health support, for students and trained students and staff on how to identify suspicious behavior on the development of reporting procedures. Support for our teachers and security staff who are having to walk around with lockdown keys and are responsible for keeping our kids safe. This causes a lot of stress both physically, mentally, and emotionally. We need to develop security teams in each school. 
that includes staff and teachers community to have a voice in our security concerns. Develop and we have to reevaluate the behavioral education plan. Develop, implement threat assessment procedures to determine whether a student poses a threat of violence. Most students who pose a threat indicate their intentions somehow. This is typically assigned to a multidisciplinary team of trained professionals such as mental health professionals and administrators and law enforcement. We need to fight for stricter gun laws and legislation at the state and federal level, but we have to do something now. Please finish up. We all have that responsibility. You have that responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. David Blaska, followed by Caden Delabarro. Thank you. I noticed that uh, you have a resolution uh, on the agenda that's asking the federal and state government to do more on gun control. Uh, I'm an NRA member and I actually support some of those uh, measures. But the fact of the matter is you could launch, uh, NASA could launch a huge magnet into outer space and if, unless it was able to suck up all 300 million guns, you're still going to have a problem in our schools. With that as a backdrop, I have to think that this school district is more interested in making numbers work in terms of students of color rather than keeping everyone safe. You've had a committee meeting since at least January of 2017 that is considering, these are some of the recommendations that are under consideration. Removing police from schools entirely, giving school officials final say over an arrest or citation, prohibiting EROs, the educational resource officers, from arresting or citing anyone, limiting or restricting EROs from carrying firearms, reducing their ability to call for backup, continuing the EROs but keep them off site until an emergency arises, getting the EROs out of their Madison police uniforms. Uh, rather than keeping students safe, and it is unfortunate that you don't trust your teachers enough to say, say that even those that have a concealed carry weapon uh, license and maybe some experience in Afghanistan or the military from protecting their students. They might actually have uh, be able to stop some of these shooters rather than holding their, their hands out and getting, uh, becoming victims themselves. I have to think that the goal of the school district is to make the arrest and expulsion numbers work because you've been played the race card. If it was up to me, I would prohibit any agency that takes state money from recording uh, any statistic based on race because after all, it's meaningless. Much more, much uh, less meaningful than uh, academic achievement, uh, any kind of disability, uh, poverty, those kinds of factors. Um, now, you had an ERO take a gun away from a student at La Follette. If you don't trust teachers with guns, do you trust them to disarm the student with guns? This uh, cops out of school thing has been dragging on for a year now, and apparently I'm told that you're scheduled to have four public hearings in April, and then you won't see action until after that. What I'm asking this school board to do tonight, since you have that resolution up there, amend that resolution and assure the people of Madison that you will continue to have uniformed, armed police officers in our high schools at least. Now, I don't know if you know Mitch Hank. Uh, I was talking to him the other day. Mitch told me that the first time he encountered Milt McPike, the late great uh, principal at East High School, Milt McPike was frog marching the student by the nape of his neck to a waiting squad car. One other thing, we, you had a chance for, you had a chance for Madison Prep, and they were emphasizing discipline. You can't teach uh, writing an English sentence or getting the hypotenuse of a triangle without discipline. So he brought some students here uh, in their, from Chicago wearing their nice, up. nice uh, uniforms and whatnot. And the Dean of Students said, I discipline hard, but I love harder. Thank you, Mr. Velasco. Caden Delabera, followed by Patrick Hickey. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Caden Delabar. I'm a 16 year old at La Follette High School. I'm a junior. And I'd just like to share a recent experience I've seen with the behavior educational plan firsthand in my classrooms. Uh, the most recent one was last week and I was sitting in class and a student was being very disruptive. The teacher told him to go to the LMC, which he refused. She said he would write him a pass and he could walk there by himself. He chose not to. So 
she decided to call behavior support, which then argued with her over the phone, which I could hear, saying to keep the student in class and that if they had time or whatever, they would get to it. And they were really pushing for her to keep the student in class and eventually she just hung up the phone and gave up, told the student to sit down and be quiet. He continued to be disruptive through class and um, disrupted my learning and everyone else in that class. Now, that's not the only experience. Three minutes is not enough to explain every time or every incident. Um, but also, recently at the meeting that um, Gracie was talking about at La Follette, I had attended with my principal. And there was a man there named Quinn, who is the behavior educational coordinator. He has told me that we, we met one on one and talked uh, at that meeting. And he has told me that he has not actually firsthand seen the behavior educational plan work in a classroom. He's never sat down and actually seen it work. And when I tried to explain to him that it doesn't work, the only thing he could say to me is that he'd prefer me not to use the term those students because that racially profiles or puts, um, uh, because he said that it's mainly black males who are being targeted uh, when it comes to this program, and he'd prefer me to use uh, words like disruptive behavior and not those students. And I have no, I had no intention of, I wasn't even thinking of race when I said those students, but the fact of the matter is that the only thing he could think of was to bring up race is honestly disgusting, and I don't know how he can implement or help implement a program that he has not seen work. That is all. Thank you. Patrick Hickey followed by Susan Stern. Superintendent, members of the board, uh, my name is Patrick Hickey. I'm a proud parent of a West High School graduate and a West High School sophomore. I recognize that these are troubling and frightening times and that you all are dealing with many weighty issues. Um, what I would actually like to speak to is something that I think is quite positive in our, in our school district, um, and that's um, the sports clubs um, throughout the district. Um, Madison West has the state champions in, in ultimate Frisbee, and they have for very, very many years. Um, we've been active parents in that effort, and unfortunately, more and more I'm getting distressed by how the school is treating the West Ultimate, uh, Ultimate Club team. Um, instead of embracing them and recognizing the wonderful things that they bring to the West High School students, it feels like the school is working against them. Um, the team tries to use the, the gym facilities, tries to rent the gym facilities, and on very short notice are often kicked out. Um, very recently, Many years of state championship trophies were removed from the school. Some were thrown out. Um, some of the students were able to track down some of the trophies before they were disposed of. 150 students at West High School participate in the boys and girls West Ultimate teams, a lot more than most of the school sports in, in the school. So I'm just, I'm just puzzled by the fact that the school doesn't embrace the, this effort. So what we're here tonight, and there's a number of others that will be speaking to this issue, is to ask you to work with us, to, to welcome these clubs, to embrace these clubs, to support these clubs. Let them use their school gyms. Let West students use West school gyms. Let West school students have their, their awards displayed at the school. The message that's being sent to these kids is the very wrong message. They want to be active, they want to uh, participate in sports, but they're getting the cold shoulder from, uh, from the administration. Um, so I, I ask you to work with us. Um, we have a number of very specific proposals that we think will go a long way in helping both West Ultimate, but a lot of other club teams throughout the district um, integrate more effectively with their schools. Um, because as I said at the beginning, we're dealing with very many difficult and troubling issues. Sports and academics are one of the shining um, aspects of our school district, and we need to support them as much as we can. And just to finish up, I would ask that everyone that is here um, from the West Ultimate Boys and Girls team and the parents supporting them just to stand up briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Stern, followed by 
Michelle Hellrod. Hi, I'm Susan Stern, and I'm here today wearing a different shirt than usual. Um, it's blue for West Ultimate. And um, I will try not to repeat what Patrick said, um, but um, I'm here for um, the same reason, and I'm a parent of two. Our older son, Malachi, graduated in 2016. Um, our younger son is a current sophomore. Um, they both um, played uh, Ultimate at West, and our older son, as a result of his experience at West for four years, is playing with the University of Minnesota, which he never would have been able to do had it not been for his experience here. Um, but each year, as I watched our older son become a more skilled player here, I watched him use um, amazingly good sportsmanship with his teammates. I don't know if you have ever watched an ultimate game, but there's no refs. So um, the players are not just learning um, to be athletes, but they're learning to negotiate with other teams um, and uh, use good sportsmanship. Um, he learned leadership, he became a captain. Um, as I said, he went on to play at the university. Um, he, each year that this was going on, um, they, uh, the West team was receiving compliments from other teams, both local and long distance. Um, they brought back state trophies and they brought back a lot of inspiration to other uh, players and uh, would-be players at West. And the team grew and grew. When um, our older son started, there was one team, um, it was a men's team that um, also welcomed um, some young women because that's the only team that there was at the time. And now look how it's grown. So you think that during that, uh, during this um, time and with that kind of environment, um, they the team would have been celebrated um, and um, it would have become easier and easier for the team to play but instead instead of announcements and celebrations when they came back from tournaments there was silence um, there have been no celebrations no announcements um, no hanging up of banners or trophies as Patrick mentioned and logistically it became more and more difficult um, for the team to be recognized as a team and for them just to exist and to practice inside when the weather was bad. So in this um, current climate with very big issues to deal with, um, safety problems to solve, thoughts of violence on people's minds, um, this is a joyful, um, easy to address, quick fix issue. And so I'm specifically here to ask you um, to guarantee um, free gym space um, for all of the ultimate teams. 500 of $1,000 has already been paid for one of the gym spaces, and I'm here to ask that that money be refunded. I'm here to ask that the space that's been reserved is guaranteed and doesn't get canceled. I'm here to ask that the coaches get respect and that the coaches are celebrated and um, that at least one of them um, is hired as an unpaid staff person, which would um, take care of a lot of the logistics. Please and the banners up. and trophies are um, hung up and celebrated. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Michelle Hellrood, and I'm a proud La Follette High School graduate. I have a child who graduated from La Follette High School, and I have a current junior that graduated from La Follette High School. I am a proud La Follette parent. I'm active in the Booster Club. And what I'm gonna talk to you about right now, I, my kid, I really have no pony in this race. My kid's graduating in a year, he's going to college. I'm concerned about the future uh, things that are going to happen at La Follette and in MS, MMSD. Um, I feel that there are many talented students and staff that comprise the Lancer community. Unfortunately, it appears that there are also a small number of students who don't want to participate in being good Lancer Pride representatives. I, um, I have personally witnessed during the regular school day and after school, kids walking in the halls, pervasive disruptions, yelling, cursing at staff, knocking on doors, making fun of children with disabilities. I've seen that with my own two eyes. Restorative justice practices that may have worked for certain infractions don't appear to be working with the kids who are constantly getting in trouble over and over. 
What it shows these kids is that there are no real consequences for their escalating behaviors. Um, I've had, I've heard from staff at La Follette High School as well as my own children that is, it is not uncommon for a student to be removed from class for discipline and for them to re be returned before the end of the um, that period, again disrupting the teacher and other students who are actually there to learn. I've talked with an, a La Follette staff member who told me of a student last week who was brought to their classroom 10 minutes into the period and then he, this student proceeded to put his head down and sleep for 60 minutes. When the kid asked for a pass to um, leave the classroom before the end of the um, period, um, the teacher told him, hey, your pass was, you know, your break was sleeping in class. I'm not going to give it to you. The kid still left. Um, this is pretty much a daily occurrence at La Follette, according to my son who is there. I do think Dr. Cheatham has many initiatives that she has proposed and set forth for the school district. I do feel that most, um, most of these initiatives need to be um, looked, uh, the initiatives need to be changed for kids who want to be in school and also the initiatives need to keep kids safe. I am a witness, to, a personal witness to the fights that happened on January 5th and I'm not sure if any of you have seen them. I was this far away from the fights. Um, there were people here in this audience that were crying. There were children, eight-year-old children, that had to witness these fights. My husband had to pull an adult off the floor because this adult who was not in the fight got pushed down to the ground. Police officers getting involved. Their walkie-talkies are flying all over. This is why we need educational officers in this school. Please finish um, up. Please and I'm just going to finish up with, Please finish up. I do want you to know that I, I want you to look at if your child or grandchild was in La Follette High School, why, why is that kid back in there? There is no reason that kid should be back in there. You can rewrite their IEP if they have a disability and give them an alternate site. Thank I, you. I, Thank you. I want people to know that that kid had a weapons charge. Thank he you. is in that school and he is, you're going to lose staff and you're going to have people open and rolling. Thank you. We really would like to listen to everyone tonight. I'm going to ask once again that everyone's, everyone's try to stay within your three minutes. There's a reason for that. So please, for the rest of you coming up, we're here you. We read your emails. Going over five minutes doesn't really add anything other than make the night longer and make business harder to conduct. So please try to stay within your three minutes. We hear you. We've read your emails. Robin Hillrod, followed by Jill Jackson. I'll be brief. I have one question. My wife spoke quite a bit, and I'll let her take some of my time up to make this go a little quicker for you. One of the things that came about from the meetings last week that we went to, it, we had small group sessions and we were talking, and one of the things that came up was that kids who come to class with five minutes to go in the period are, by district policy, to be marked tardy, not absent. I think that's ridiculous. In the real world, that's not how it works. When that was brought up, the gentleman from the district that was there said that's not a district policy. A teacher who was part of our small group went back and found the document. So I was told as a parent that that's not district policy when it was brought up. I was told, nope, that's not what we told them to do when we got marked down for the scores. Now, after the fact, I'm finding out that that's in fact true. Do you think it's reasonable for a 90 minute period for a kid to show up for five minutes and to be considered tardy and not absent? That's my question. Thank you. Jill Jackson, followed by Pichel Jose. Hello. Um, you've heard a lot of parents say how they're concerned. Obviously, La Follette's become a problem. That is my concern. My daughter is not a number. She, she is my life. Um, I want to make sure that my face is in front of you, realizing that she is a person and her safety along with her fellow classmates and teachers are in jeopardy. 
Um, unlike other parents, I don't want to know why that that boy was given a second chance is back in that school. There's nothing you could tell me that would give me a liable excuse as to why we're here today. Why are things escalating? I, I can't even wrap my head around it. So I guess I'm here to say, please take a look at La Follette. Security measures need to go up. My daughter work, walks down the hallway and she has to elbow to get her way through. Um, it's getting ridiculous. Tensions are escalating. Please quit ignoring. That's it. Thank you. I may not be pronouncing this right, so it's Pacheco Jose. Okay. Followed by Colleen Freitag. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jose Pacheco. I am a parent of a student at La Follette. And the main issue is safety in there, OK? I, I, I think the reason I came here is just to express how disappointed I am on, the, on how things are being handled at the school at this moment. And the main reason come to find out is because most of the stuff that needs to happen has to be approved by the board. How is that possible that if you have a person that is in charge of the school, you're not letting those persons make those decisions when they work day in and day out at that place? There is decisions that they can be implemented right away by the principal, by teachers, by you empowering them to make those decisions. So maybe start making some of those changes so the uh, security maybe starts to improve at the school, not just at La Follette, but at all the Madison schools. Uh, finally, I'm gonna keep it short, but I wanna go from here tonight and go and tell my kid that, you know what, maybe tomorrow you're not gonna feel as afraid to go to school as you were yesterday, which for all of us, it should be a wake up call. What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for a shooting? Is that what are we waiting for? I don't want my kid to be afraid to go to school. I don't think any parent want their kid to go, be afraid to go to school. We need to wake up. We need to do this. This is an urgency to do something about it. Not just the school board, but you guys are the ones that have the power to do something about it. Let's do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen Freetag, followed by Roger Lane. Hello. I'm a proud parent of a 2016 La Follette graduate, and my son is a current senior. Um, as Michelle indicated, we're almost out of there, but I have so many friends, our neighbors, that will be attending La Follette, or maybe not, if they choose to open enroll, which many are talking about. So first off, to Calissa, I'm so sorry for what you've gone through, um, but I applaud you for being brave enough to stand up here and tell us your story. And I hope everything is taken care of to help you through this down the road. Um, next, I want to send a huge thank you to Officer Rod Johnson, who is the Educational Resource Officer at La Follette, who was, uh, and all the others who were instrumental in stopping a potentially horrific ex incident from occurring at last Wednesday, at La Follette last Wednesday. Ironically, that occurred about two, two and a half hours before a discussion you were having, and some of you would choose to have them be removed from our schools just two hours before. This is what happened, and he was able to help diffuse this situation. Keep that in mind when you do your voting. Uh, next, I just want to say I am disgusted at the lack of common sense 
that seems to be used in allowing a kid, even one weapons offense, to allow them back in, to come back and allow that second offense to happen. I'm disgusted with this behavior education plan and with all the chances that are allowed to, and I'm gonna say it, these kids or the offenders or the disruptive behavior who are putting our kids and our valuable teachers and the staff and I'm sure it's not just at La Follette, from all of the things I've been reading, it's all across this city. You are putting innocent people at risk daily, daily. So I sent an email, and as I said in my email, the alarm has sounded. So stop hitting the snooze and wake up. Please, please, please wake up. Thank you. Roger Lane, followed by Scott Smith. Thank you for your time. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Roger Lane. I have a daughter that goes to West High School. This is rather uh, a simple issue. Uh, there appears to be a lack of respect from the athletic department with regards to affiliated sports, uh, specifically Ultimate Frisbee. Um, there has seemed uh, trophies have disappeared as well as uh, gym time has been uh, deleted from their time space. I believe that uh, there's simple actions that could be taken, uh, have, providing a display case for the trophies for affiliated sports, uh, and then also reviewing gym policies uh, to prevent double booking of the gym. I know this is an issue with the West, for the West High School principal. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to know, let you know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Smith, followed by Greg Murray. Hi, I'm Scott Schmidt. I've got two kids at LaFollet. Um, just want to remind everyone, if you work in a, in a professional setting, if, if you work at Trek Bikes, if you work at the utility I work for, if you work at the City of Madison, um, safety is table stakes. In other words, if you're not willing to invest enough money into your business to make sure that your employees go home safe, you, don't, you shouldn't be in business, and you, and you won't be. You will you'll be shut down, okay? Table stakes, that's what we're talking about here. So if you can't provide a safe place, you shouldn't be doing it, okay? It should be number one. ERO, number one. So, I mean, it's... it's it's just, it's just common sense that if you can't provide safety, when, when we have a sprained knee, because one of our workers sprains their knee, we write it up, we figure out how did they sprain their knee, and we then close off that area so that it doesn't happen again. We keep that employee safe, and employees going home the same way they showed up. And it's, it's actually, I mean, I'm not trying to lecture, I'm just saying all of you likely work in a business where you go home safe every night confidently and if you don't you can quit and you can get go to another company that is willing to put up table stakes okay so just think about that when you go home at the end of the day how much stress you've had I mean one of my one of my daughter's classmates sits in the back of the room because she doesn't want to be in the line of fire not cool thank you Greg Murray, followed by Abby Peterson. Hi, I'm Greg Murray. I'm a parent of a, a La Follette sophomore, and I've got an eighth grader who'll be going there next year. Um, there have been so many good things stated here by a lot of the La Follette parents. You've said, you've read the emails and listened to us. I know some of the board members, K2s, called me after I sent my email, and we appreciate that. But the bottom line of the message here from us parents, and I think Jose did a wonderful job articulating it, the problem is serious. It is acute, and we need solutions now. We don't need long-term plans. We don't need more studies. We need action immediately. I think a lot of us, I'll speak for myself, I appreciate the email that Principal Stortz set out to start to outline some of those. 
You all need to support those efforts. You need to fund those efforts. You need to take charge. You all are going to probably consider and probably pass uh, a very important resolution on gun safety tonight, asking the state and federal government to do things. We are here asking you. You are in control of these schools here in Madison. We need you to take charge of these schools, use your resources, and make these improvements immediately for the safety of our kids. So I'm hoping that you empower Mr. Storch to do what he said to do with funds and support and training. Empower the teachers. The, the morale of the great teachers we have at that school is just being undermined. They don't have control of their classrooms. It's impeding the education of the other kids there. And it's, it's not effective. You have to give them the resources, the training, so they can do their job, which is to teach and teach our kids. It's important, it's imperative, and it's now. And if you don't fix this, you are going to lose good teachers, you are going to lose students, and you are going to lose parents. And this is one of those moments in an institution of this size and this complexity that if you don't make change, if you don't pivot, I don't know much about the behavioral improvement plan. I'm, I'm just a dad. I haven't studied it. I don't know the data. but I. I've worked in government and I've worked in the private sector and I applaud creativity but if the thing ain't working fix it pivot it change it I mean you're creative people you are in charge we implore you the last thing I'll say I don't know if my three minutes is up is this is there have some steps been that been that have been put out there execute them implement them we need to see change these parents are watching and we expect results thank you Thank you. Abby Peterson, followed by Chris Peterson. Uh, hi, my name is Abby Peterson, and I am the captain of the West Women's Ultimate Team. This is my fourth year playing Ultimate, and it has taught me, it has been amazing. It's taught me leadership, focus, as well as patience. But the recognition is not there. We have won our state competition for the past three years. Last year, we were nationally recognized for our spirit and sportsmanship, but at our school, we do not feel that. I am here asking for the athletic department to recognize Ultimate Frisbee and give us the equality we deserve. Ultimate Frisbee is one of the biggest sports at Madison West High School, and is it extremely hurtful to have our hard-earned trophies not displayed in our trophy case, along with all of the other sports like basketball, baseball, or soccer. Along with that, it is extremely frustrated to be bumped from our paid and reserved gym space, and we're just here asking for the same respect that, and for the over 100 students that are involved in the sport that any other school would get. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chris Peterson, followed by Eric Lucinron. Good evening. Um, I'm here to uh, support the Frisbee, uh, Ultimate Frisbee at West. I'm also here to support my daughter. Um, I don't want to be redundant tonight. You've heard a lot. Uh, as a parent of a senior at West and a sophomore at West, uh, hearing what's going on in La Follette and a couple of the other issues with uh, that young lady who I admire, um, uh, I understand this isn't probably the top of your agenda right now. I get that. I, I ask you to have it on your agenda because I understand as a parent uh, that uh, the safety of our children are, are, is extremely important. Uh, but in saying that, I would like you to uh, understand that how hard these athletes work and to have some recognition is important for them. I've been uh, in sports for 30 years and it's important that when, when, a, when an athlete does something well that they're recognized to get gym space. It's, it's just small things. I would also ask, and I don't even know if they have it at West, is to form some kind of athletic committee. I think it's very important to be transparent. And when rumors are out there, when I hear say of, you know, from the students, from the athletic director, it, it, it's very frustrating. And if you, um, I don't even know if they have an athletic uh, committee, but if they had one, you could get parents that are interested to try to make a difference. Um, so that's what I'd ask, and good luck. I know you guys' job is tough, so good luck tonight. Thank you. Eric? Eric? Pardon? No, you cannot take it in a plot spot. Please have a seat. 
Peter Godfrey, followed by Lynn Poster. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Graffy. I'm the uh, coach of the Madison West High School Ultimate Team uh, for the boys' side. Uh, you've heard a lot about this already today, and I actually came in and talked to you guys a couple months ago about some of the gym space things. I don't know if you remember that, and sent some emails out. Um, I'm here basically with the same message. There have been some developments, um, but uh, and, I, and I've met with quite a few people within the administration about kind of the issues that we've been facing. And the solution that I think comes with this, and it's something that you guys are going to have to think about, as well as um, some of the other people, like Karen Kepler, who I've been talking to a lot, and Jeremy Schlitz as well, is uh, there are a lot of kids who are in the club sports realm. And at West, we have a massive program. When I first started four years ago coaching, we had like 20 kids, and now for the boys' side, we have over 100. We have more kids than we have the ability to coach, honestly. Um, and it's only growing and getting bigger. And it's awesome because we're giving these kids the opportunity to play sports when they might not have that opportunity otherwise. And they're learning a lot about themselves as people, players, everything. And it's great to be a part of that. And I'm doing it for free because I love to do it. And I will continue to do it for free. Um, and so what I'm kind of proposing is that club sports have been falling into this realm where they're neither a club nor a sport. And that's kind of where we are right now. We don't get that WIA distinction, so we don't get a lot of the resources that come with being WIAA. Um, but us being a club isn't really tenable either because we aren't really a club, to be perfectly honest. We're more of a sport than a club, and we're, we're outgrowing that club name. Um, because the people who oversee clubs at West, they already have their hands full with like, you know, all sorts of different card clubs and math club and all sorts of other things. Um, so we as a sport have needs that are more specific to other sports, which is why it doesn't make a lot of sense um, to have no resources available and we have to charter buses to go to all sorts of different places. The barriers that get created by that when we have no support from the MMSD um, are much too great and we have tons of kids who are on free and reduced lunch and we are the ones that have to pick up the slack in order to help those kids play. So what I'm proposing is that in order to fill that gap, you have to kind of create a new distinction in order to um, accommodate these kids who are choosing to play these club sports. And that means that I think we need to make new uh, positions available for people like me so that I can be liable, I can be MMSD, I can be liable um, and be basically the, the head of the program and I can represent within West High School, we can get free gym space, we can do all these different things and you can hire me at no pay. I'm going to do it for free anyway so you might as well take advantage of me for that. And that's basically what we can do is you create the position, you don't pay me anything, I'm able to have a seat at the table to talk with the other coaches, to be a part of the athletic department, and we can be a sport in every sense of the term without being WIAA, which is just a silly distinction that is ultimately leading to discriminatory practices with a lot of kids at West and across the district. So that's my proposal, and I hope you take advantage of that. Thanks. Thank you. Well, that concludes our public uh, speaking for this evening. And, uh, and, and uh, sir, you're out of order. Listen to me. You're out of order. You're out of order. You won't be, get to speak. You have to be here at 6 o'clock in order to speak. Otherwise, we can have people coming in the door all night long to speak. So you're out of order. You do not get to speak. This is a business meeting, and we're moving on. So please sit down. Please sit down, sir. Okay, next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. <clears throat> Pardon? Okay. And uh, we will table uh, our approval of minutes to next month. Next item on the agenda is board president's announcements and reports. First item on the agenda is, uh, is, has to do with gun violence. And due to the heartbreaking school shooting that occurred in Parkland, Florida, the Board of Education would like to address the ongoing issue of gun violence and how the Madison Metropolitan School District can be prepared to deal with the national academic moving forward while ensuring that all of our students can feel safe and be safe while learning. And we do have a resolution uh, that will be read at this time. Pardon. Whereas, we are deeply saddened and angered by the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And whereas, this is the latest tragedy in an all-too-common trend in our country. And whereas, our students and staff 
have the right to learn and teach in an environment where they are not worried about the threat of a school shooting. And whereas school safety is not a political issue, and our legislative leaders at the state and federal level have not only the ability, but the responsibility to act on behalf of our children. Whereas we echo the statement made by students mobilizing around the Parkland tragedy, school safety is not a political issue. There cannot be two sides to doing everything in our power to ensure the lives and futures of children who are at risk of dying when they should be learning, playing, and growing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Madison Board of Education and MMSD administration demand the immediate passage of comprehensive legislation that effectively addresses our nation's persistent and pervasive gun problem. Legislation that would make universal background checks mandatory, ban assault weapons, ban aftermarket rapid fire devices, and keep people who are subject to domestic violence protection orders from having guns, and prevent the possibility that any student, teacher, or parent would ever possess a gun on school grounds. Be it further resolved that this statement be permanently imprinted in the Board of Education minutes <laughs> for the meeting of February 26, 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next on the agenda, we will, the Board of Education will read a resolution regarding taxpayer-funded private voucher schools and the expectations our district has for potential expansion. So a formal resolution will be read by Board Member Moffitt. Thank you. Whereas the Madison School District School Board, educators, staff, families, and community are united in our effort to pro provide thriving schools where every student can excel. And whereas the Madison School District supports local control and the ability of the elected Board of Education to make decisions to support the learning of our students. And whereas taxpayer funded vouchers increasingly pay tuition for students attending private schools in Wisconsin. And whereas vouchers take resources directly from our public schools and continue the trend of cutting funding to public schools and whereas private school voucher advocates have consistently pushed for expanding the use of taxpayer funded vouchers to pay tuition for students in private schools in Wisconsin. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Madison School Board calls on Governor Scott Walker and the Wisconsin Legislature to support the Wisconsin voucher, um, to support the Wisconsin voucher taxpayer transparency bill in an effort to be open, honest, and transparent with the taxpayers of Wisconsin. Be it further resolved that the Madison School Board calls on Governor Scott Walker and the Wisconsin Legislature to oppose expansions to private school vouchers, and be it further resolved that the Madison School Board urges the state government to phase out taxpayer-funded private school vouchers and instead invest fully in Wisconsin's public schools. Thank you, Board Member Moffitt. And lastly, the Board would like to recognize Black History Month, which is celebrated annually in February. <laughs> the month of February, dating back to 1970s, has been a month which hosts a nationwide effort to recognize an often neglected accomplishment of African Americans in the United States. Each year, Black History Month recognizes the achievements of some of the most influential leaders and social justice heroes in the United States history. Because of this continuous recognition, our youth are able to have a more realistic understanding and knowledge of underrepresented groups of people that have contributed to the well-being of the American society. And the resolution is, whereas each year throughout February, we celebrate the achievements of African Americans and pay tribute to the central role <laughs> of black Americans in United States history. Whereas MMSD is re resolutely committed to providing equitable educational opportunities for all students and to teaching the curriculum that is culturally responsive, historically accurate, and multicultural. Whereas as the Board of Education, we applaud and thank our schools for celebrating Black History Month with programs, ceremonies, and inclusive activities that underscore the significant achievements of African Americans. Whereas as a school district, we believe we must recognize black history, not just in February, but throughout the year. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Madison Board of Education and the MMSD celebrate, value, and recognize the contributions of black Americans, including those of our staff, families, and community partners and leaders, and we especially celebrate our black scholars 
and future history makers. Now, be it further resolved that this statement be permanently imprinted in the Board of Education minutes for the meeting of February 26, 2018. Thanks to everyone who uh, read resolutions today. And uh, Mr. Merck, you have uh, some input at this moment. Uh, yes, just very, very briefly. Um, I just want to know two things about the voucher resolution. Uh, the first is that um, it is very important that our public schools be accessible to the public and controlled by the public. Many of you came and spoke to us tonight. You're not happy with us. You can't do that with a voucher, voucher school. But you can vote for us or against us, and we're accountable to you. And secondly, I want to point out that um, many school districts in Wisconsin have passed resolutions concerning voucher schools and, 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 and the voucher programs. I believe Madison is the first one to pass one that calls for a phase out and I, um, instead of just halting the expansion. And I, I, I think it's important that we've gone on record for that, and I thank the fellow board members for supporting that position. All right, thank you, Mr. Merrick. I'm sorry. Okay, now you guys, everybody know we got a lot on the agenda I, tonight. Just Nine quick. o'clock come around. I don't want anyone to talk about what time it is. Okay, uh, Mr. Yeah, Loomis. Can we, can we send the Stillman Douglas resolution to their board? A along with maybe a, a letter also. I, I, I mean, usually this thing just sit in our minutes, but I would, yeah. you know, we're all trying to do something for them, but at least that's a little thing we can let them know we're thinking about it. We can do that? Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, that concludes the board president's announcements and reports. Now we'll move to superintendent's announcements and reports, and uh, it will Please to have her give us a school safety update. Thank you, James. Um, I'm going to have a few members of our team join us. Sure. So if you'll allow a quick transition, uh, Joe Ballas, Karen Kepler, Alex Raylan, and, and Mike Perry. So I'll just give them a, a 30 seconds to settle in. Okay, thanks guys. Um, we're going to have an important discussion about safety and security tonight. Um, usually these presentations are meant to be celebratory in nature and um, given what's been happening across the country and here in our own community in the last couple of weeks, um, I knew it was important to have this conversation tonight. I want to thank our parents and our staff our students for their partnership over the last two weeks. Um, this has been a very challenging time given the events that happened in Florida um, almost two weeks ago. We are all rightfully worried, as James recently said, about the safety of the children we serve. Um, it, it, of course, remains the top priority, not only in our school district, but in every school district. Um, I also want to acknowledge the specific concerns from the La Follette community. Um, I was able to meet with many of them last Tuesday evening um, for a discussion. I've heard from many of you in the past week. I want to thank you for your emails, your feedback, your suggestions, your questions um, delivered with urgency and candor. Um, and we've heard more of those comments tonight. Um, it is an urgency every one of us shares. I know the school board shares as well. I know our team shares. Um, not just as educators who care deeply about students, but many of us are parents of students in our schools as well. Um, and we embrace this dialogue. We know that our actions will be more effective um, because of it. Um, tonight, I thought it was important to share with the board and the public just a few thoughts on safety and security in general. Um, uh, and Joe Ballas and Karen Kepler are here to talk to us about that. Um, we want to talk, um, again, in general about the improvements we want to make. Um, and we want to focus a portion of our conversation on the targeted actions that we want to take to support La Follette High School. Um, so that's what we've got planned for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with a few comments from Karen Kepler about the proactive strategies that we take um, to uh, support the safety and security of our schools. Karen, you can pull that out too if it's, you should bring it close to your mouth. That's what one thing I've learned. A little awkward, okay. 
Yeah. So they okay. can hear back there. That's right. Come again. Speak close so they can hear back there. Right up there. Okay. So I'm going to go a little off script a little bit, and it's okay. Um, I was born in Milwaukee, but also raised in Madison for the last 20 years, and Madison. Um, raised me as a leader with strong foundations around safety and security and James you are a parent of mine at Emerson Elementary School and I do come with um, good um, background and structure because I was raised right um, with these strong foundations so I appreciate that and I come to the table with um, wanting to be part of the solution to again bring back that east side pride west side pride and making sure that people know that we take care of our our children here so um, a couple of things that um, overall for safety and security the strong foundations to make sure that um, we have things are visible in our school some of the things to highlight we have policies and procedures that parents would see coming through our schools visitor policies, when we release students, who we release them to. Um, supervision schedules are very important, so you should see staff around the school, you see people outside supervising our children, so those are just some basic foundations. Um, staff trainings around those protocols should be taking place in the schools. Um, we have other things like strengthen strengthening our facility improvements that we've made the past a uh, few years now with secured entrances and also um, intercoms and videos, so putting more in place that weren't in place 12, 15 years ago. So we appreciate that. And then also to say a big strategy is the ERO's and safety and security assistance in our secondary school. So we have 26 SSAs and also four ERO's. Oh, sorry, I was in charge of transitions and then I was uh, listening so closely I forgot to transition. Um, we are going to pass it over to Joe Ballas, um, who maybe can say a little bit about himself as well, yep. um, about the responsive strategies we put into place um, around safety and security. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Superintendent. Well, as Karen, I've been in the business of public safety in Madison for over three decades. And it's been an honor since last April to be part of uh, Superintendent Cheatham's team here at the district. And I see my work in public safety just continuing uh, with the district here. Um, I've had a chance to um, get involved in a lot of different ways in the last six uh, plus months. Actually, I guess it's almost nine months now. Um, but uh, I can tell you that some of the foundational documents that uh, exist here in the district around safety and security are solid. Um, um, documents and protocols and procedures in and of themselves. Um, it's not that the, some of them can't be tweaked, um, but uh, one of them I brought with me tonight is one that I'm sure many of you have seen, is our emergency procedures. Um, this is an ex excellent document. Um, and when Luis and I spent a lot of time uh, reviewing a lot of materials uh, when we transitioned uh, back last spring, but um, things in here with regards to fire evacuation, how we respond to outside threat, uh, schools and fight disturbances. I mean, it's basically uh, uh, about everything that you can possibly imagine. It's, it's boiled down to about 14, 15 uh, flip charts here um, that we uh, provide to staff. The, uh, at the school base level, where this all, where the rubber hits the road, um, the principals out there, really, as I see them, they're kind of like the captain of their neighborhoods. Um, and uh, some of them are uh, larger than others. But those school-based uh, critical response teams, the principal, the principal designee, and I can't speak to how important that uh, is in our uh, structure here, where there's always somebody, uh, regardless if it's elementary, all the way up to high school, somebody is in charge um, at that building. Um, we have the uh, office staff, the, the secretarial staff, the trainings that we do for them um, around our school visitor protocols. Um, even the custodial staff, when you get in the elementary level, <coughs> are an integral part of uh, how we keep our schools safe. Then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, that school-based critical response team, uh, when we do have our larger incidents, um, we want school-based staff to know that they call upon us downtown and central office. And our central office critical <coughs> incident response team, for the first uh, three on the front line is myself, Karen Kepler, and Kelly Ruppel. Um, when they call 663-1632, uh, uh, they're trying to find one of us. And uh, 
we then are providing them uh, support, consultation. At times, uh, like the Sherwood Hills incident this past week, I was on site there within 10 to 15 minutes, and I've done that a number of times where I just simply drive, it's just easier, drive right to the uh, school site and work hands-on with staff there, um, especially if MPD is responding or other police and trying to help coordinate that. Um, whenever we get done with these, when something else I wanted to mention too, it's really important, is the critical incident debriefings and follow-up action planning. Um, and that happens both formally and informal. Some of the larger incidents that happened recently, the La Follette incident last week and the Sherwood Hills incident, um, both of them we plan to do formal uh, critical incident debriefings. And we have uh, in our uh, school safety and practices strategies, which the website link was up there too <laughs> on our website, um, that is one of our best practices. And we'll go through that process um, in those two incidents. But a lot of times it's just informal. Um, I've spent, uh, uh, I was out at La Follette after the fight after the basketball game. Um, there was another girl fight over there a couple weeks ago. Uh, Sean and I sat there in that commons and we look at it and one of the principles that um, we use a lot in policing is called SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And when we look at that commons area at La Follette High School, that really seems to be the gathering spot where a lot of issues develop. So we look at that from an environmental standpoint and try to figure out what can we do to this commons area to modify that or be more creative with that space. Um, I did a project in the police department at Olin Park years ago. Um, many of you probably saw about, but our community policing team, we worked on ways how we could change and bring legitimate people into Olin Park in order to take and reclaim that public space. You know, some, sometimes in some of our school spaces, we get, you know, that commons is a public space yet inside the school. How do we think about how we construct that area um, and the policies and practices that we put in place that actually might be able to eliminate a lot of the behavior that we see manifesting itself there by just simple modifications to the environment. Um, on the second page, oh, there you got it, yep. Karen, thank you. Um, I hit upon visitor <laughs> protocols, school entrances, um, and Karen touched, touched upon some of that uh, uh, we work closely with Chad Weesey and Joe Anderson, and we really are trying to do a lot of things as money uh, allows us to the uh, welcome centers. Um, I've seen some uh, really neat <laughs> things like at Kennedy Elementary jumps into mind about how their welcome center was redesigned over there, which is really neat. Um, now Dr. Baran over at West High School, we're actually engaging a conversation at West, how we could actually build some kind of wet welcome center at West, yeah. and how we might create that and put some uh, proposals forward. So there's a lot of thinking being done around that. Um, district-based uh, school and safety risk assessments. Um, long story short there, um, we really need to look at a comprehensive uh, assessment of safety and security from top to bottom. Um, I think you've heard a lot about it tonight, but really, um, how do we create a better culture of safety uh, in the school district? Um, uh, we, uh, there's, there's a lot of people we need to bring to the table. Um, one example is um, after the recent uh, Florida shooting, I've been doing a lot of discussion, actually I was doing it before this, with the MPD, um, and they got a team of officers that does a civilian response active shooter encounter training. Um, it's based on some newer principles that are out there that uh, more communities are looking at. Um, uh, Alice training has been referred to. The CRACE training, we're actually meeting with Sergeant Engel, looking at our code red protocols and see how we can look at other aspects of defense um, or avoid and flee, and one of the things I brought up with La Follette last week is just, um, and we do have a uh, avoid uh, aspect in our code red protocols, but it's also predicated on people who need to know where their evacuation sites are. And, do, and we don't have a lot of schools that actually practice evacuations. Sherman Ellum, uh, Middle School, I gave them an example back in October. They took sixth, seventh, and eighth grade one afternoon last October, and they marched all every kid in that school up to their evacuation site three blocks away. So those kids knew exactly where to go to in the event they had to evacuate their building. And it's not just for an active shooter, but it's for an empty, a gas leak, it could be a fire, it could be any reason that building becomes uninhabitable. But are our schools prepared to evacuate? And are our parents ready to respond to that evacuation point and pick them up? I think we need to challenge ourselves in our schools to see, to see if we can answer those questions. <coughs> Lastly, um, I wanna make a reference to closing the communication gap. Um, increasingly, as we work to respond to critical incidents, social media presents an increasing challenge to us in our communication to our school community about the incident. At times, the use of social media by our students and families to disseminate, disseminate unvetted information has actually made matters worse and our critical response more difficult. 
yet we also realize that some social media platforms might actually help us communicate in a more timely manner to our school communities when a critical incident does occur and is currently being responded to. Police departments, they didn't like it, but a lot of them started to go to Twitter to put information out, even about uh, bad accidents on the Beltline and things like that. And I can remember when MPD first started doing that and we weren't a big fan of it. But you wanna know, know something? We, the old it's way of putting out. letters in backpacks and, uh, tra and taking three hours, four hours to write the letter and get it out to school, we gotta find a way to better communicate to families because uh, they are finding out about it anyways. And we, even if we don't have it completely all together, but we gotta let them know that something happened after school and we need to work on closing that communication gap. All right, thank you, Joe. So those are some key areas of attention that we wanna dig into in the coming uh, weeks and months um, specific to safety and security in general. At this point, I'd like to transition our presentation uh, to a targeted focus on La Follette High School, which has been, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, concern among many. And I'm gonna let Alex take the lead on where we are, where we've been, where we are, and where we wanna go uh, with urgency. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, I'd like to know that this year in particular has been difficult um, for our high schools. Yeah, let's get close. Get closer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they need, they wanna hear this. I'm limited by the space I have here. Um, so yeah, I'd like to note that this year has been particularly challenging for our high schools. Um, although the conversation tonight is gonna primarily focus on La Follette, um, there are similar um, challenges in, in each of our high schools. Um, and as a former principal who served over a thousand kids and families, there is nothing more daunting and there is nothing that you lose more sleep over than thinking about how safe um, uh, <laughs> is the school. Not just physically, but the emotional and intellectual safety of kids is the thing that keeps uh, people up at night, particularly the principal, the school leaders, and I know that many of our staff are grappling with that as well. And I'm hoping that the urgency that you heard in the parents tonight is reflected in some of the actions that we've taken thus far um, and the ones that we'll take, uh, we'll take later. Being in schools regularly, um, which I think is a critical uh, part of my job, I see the tireless efforts of our staff, um, particularly at high schools, as they are attempting to leverage and build on their ninth grade on track systems, as well as their culture and climate systems. Uh, to ensure that eighth graders are transitioning really, really well um, to stay and remain on track, uh, particularly in the first year of high school. And we're seeing some signs that it's improving, um, but maybe not, not necessarily at the pace that we would like to see. Um, our ninth and tenth graders are disproportionately reflected uh, in the number of conflicts and the number of fights um, than in past years. Uh, thus, we've had, we've had to ramp up um, our support strategies that we had to actually start early. Um, given the large number of new staff at La Follette High School, we had to actually start uh, early with um, building the capacity of those uh, school leaders uh, and support staff, particularly those who are closest to their culture and climate work. Um, we have three specific mentors and coaches who are working directly with the staff um, and started early this year. Um, we have, unfortunately, um, a vacancy for an assistant principal at La Follette High School. Uh, we worked with the school to uh, replace that, that particular position because the school couldn't find an assistant principal uh, with a coordinator, uh, coordinator of student services, uh, whose job was to work with the admin team to align um, their culture and climate work with their student services staff, um, specifically around their PBS services. Our team uh, facilitates a weekly call with La Follette High School um, that's centered around a pretty robust plan um, and is designed to make sure that there is mutual accountability. We want to make sure that the school has systems in place. We also want to make sure that we are clear and articulate about our supports for the school to actually implement that plan. Um, we're constantly in the place of getting feedback about how well we're both doing that. Those at central office uh, serving the school and the school who's actually implementing um, that plan, which is really focused on the universal PBS systems um, MTSS, um, uh, meeting the needs of students with disabilities, um, and actually getting down to specific students who the school is struggling to serve. 
Uh, we currently have seven school support uh, requests into the school. Uh, three of them are focused just on ninth grade, and the other three are focused um, on their culture and climate. Uh, our, can you explain that phrase that you have school support? School support request. Request. Yeah. Can you explain that phrase? Yeah. So a school makes a request to the central office to say, hey, we have a particular challenge that we don't necessarily have enough capacity to do ourselves. Therefore, we need your assistant, assistance. Uh, the school, school support partner uh, facilitates that process, works with the school to identify what their problem is, um, and then brokers the support from central office to make sure that the right people um, are at the school to work al alongside the school to provide that specific service. Right. Thank you. Yes, yeah, no problem. Um, so our team continues to leverage uh, culture and climate visits. This is where we um, visit with the school um, and the school representatives, our you know, principals, school support staff, those who are closest to uh, the behavior response system as well as culture and climate to make sure um, that we are working closely with them specifically as a respond to meeting the increasing needs of students with significant needs, uh, which we've seen are kind of across the board at all of our schools and specifically at Follett. Uh, I can give an example of one particular meeting we had about three weeks ago where uh, we focused on 13 students that the school had identified. We looked at the data for these 13 students. There were concerns that some of the students were involved in gangs. Um, we looked at the adequate the supports that were being provided to students to see if they were adequate and to meet a specific need where the school couldn't necessarily do it themselves. Um, out of that process, we did a case study of one particular student just to figure out if we did it for this one student, could we do it for the others? Um, and we're learning um, from that one case study um, that's leading to other um, better supports that are in place, specifically given the resources that are already existent in the school, uh, such as the work um, with our NIP workers, um, in the type of um, small group supports that they're providing students who are currently enrolled. And we're working closely with the principal and MTI um, to enhance their collaborative problem solving systems. We want to make sure that there is a greater swath of teachers uh, whose perspective and whose voice is at the table to really think about the real problems as teachers see them um, and the systems are in place to actually support them uh, given some of the concerns we even heard tonight about uh, the behavior response system. Uh, constantly pressure testing, pre pressure testing them uh, to make sure um, the teachers um, are getting the adequate support to actually help kids. So I know you received a, a copy of the letter that the principal sent out to families, so I'm not going to go through all those points. I did want to highlight just a couple. Um, I want to thank Joe Ballas and MPD who um, provided kind of a temporary uh, additional uh, officer to support the school. I, want, I know in the paper it was communicated that it was the second ERO. Um, it is only additional officer to work alongside the ERO. Um, we, we thought it was important to reassure uh, the students and the families and the staff during this unique time um, to kind of build their confidence in, in uh, the people who are there to support them. So I know Joe, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Quick question, that's a temporary that ERO is correct. or permanent ERO? And how long would that ERO be there? No, the, the ERO that's there the is permanent. Yeah, the, the additional officer that's, that's going to be working with the ERO is about two to... It's, we're doing it on a week-by-week week basis right now, Nikki, and all the officers being selected that back up, work mm -hmm. with Rod, are all former EROs, or they intimately know the kids that are at La Folla. That's what I needed. Thank you. Uh, the school is taking significant steps to um, increase presence in the hallways. You heard that theme tonight about um, students who are in the hallways who are even leaving class or getting to class late. Um, the team is focused on developing a more assertive monitoring system, um, specifically at lunchtime and before and after school as a great number of kids are moving throughout the school. Um, if you remember from East last year, we had uh, a significant increase in, um, in conflicts between females. Um, and I know our student services team is working uh, with the LaFala team to better figure out what are the right additional supports outside of what the school is doing um, to help <laughs> students resolve conflicts uh, safety, uh, safely uh, while also leveraging the restorative practices um, that the school just several years ago was actually uh, recognized for. Um, given what we know qualitatively and what the data tells us, uh, ninth and 10th graders are, are having more difficulty appreciating this notion and concept of an open campus for lunch. Um, I, I, I would venture to say that it's not just La Fala, but all of our high schools uh, will need at this point to actually engage stakeholders to really figure out is that an adequate 
um, privilege um, for ninth and 10th graders uh, given uh, what we're seeing uh, in incidents uh, and um, of monitoring and having the ability to monitor uh, up to sometimes a dozen or more doors uh, at that particular time. So lastly, you know, I'll say that um, despite the increased enrollment at both Capitol High and Shabazz uh, for, second, for second semester, we are still in need of a quality student-centered options for kids um, who are not finding significant success in our comprehensive high schools. Um, we've already received commitments from community members to be a part of a design process that actually includes students. Um, we're considering running a parallel process on the west side given what we're learning from uh, West and Memorial. Um, we're experiencing similar challenges and we hope to have a pilot site up uh, and running in about three weeks. Um, uh, we believe that if you can create more options for students, uh, we'll be able to be better meet their needs um, and reduce the amount of distractions and disruptions um, in our high schools um, by providing kids an opportunity uh, to really leverage their talents and their assets towards post-secondary success. Um, so with that, I'll close. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'd like to add one last thing before I pass it back to you, James. Yeah, can we move it along, though? I mean, oh, yeah. I, I thought this wasn't going to be a big pre a presentation section. So well, I apologize for that. I thought it was important right to be to thorough to given the content. Um, I was just going to add that given the questions that came from the audience regarding expellable offenses and weapons that I wanted to address that publicly. Um, I think um, it's important for everyone to know that uh, a weapon of any sort, uh, whether it's a BB gun um, or a real gun, um, is a gun yep. and it is absolutely an expellable offense and um, students do receive due process and um, uh, anyone who's reached out to us I'll make sure that they can see what that process looks like um, what, what's incumbent upon us is that a student who who may not ultimately be expelled because of that due process that we are creating uh, an incredibly tight safety plan for that child and ensuring that we're um, following through on the most appropriate placement. Um, and again, I don't know uh, yet uh, the answers to those questions, but I want to make sure that everyone knows that's part of the process that we put in pl into place for any child um, who, who, uh, who does something like that. Um, it is uh, an incredibly uh, uh, serious offense and one that we take very seriously. Um, James, sorry that it took a little longer than we had hoped. I'm going to pass it right back to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Because I, I know the board has questions that they like to get answered tonight. Mm -hmm. I think we, we need to get to board questions. Yep. And um, yeah, I guess to start off, um, you know, how did we get here? You know, how did we end up in a place where all these families and staff felt that they needed to? come to the board tonight and uh, you know sort of plead their hearts out to help their school yeah. you know, how did we get here uh, years ago we talked about I mean years ago we talked and asked a question about um, does the science of PVIS work does the science work when we were implementing this program years ago board members asked will the science work because if we have students that um, have issues are we just going to allow them to remain in class mm -hmm. if we cannot correct their behaviors? This was a conversation we had years ago. Mm -hmm. Does the science of PBIS work? There's a lot of misinformation out there. I think uh, a lot of information about the BEP not working. I think yeah. it's really more about implementation. It's not really the BEP, uh, but we won't address that at the moment. But how did we get here? My main question to lead off board discussion tonight is, if we're going to lose staff, if we're going to lose students in the district, it's going to be because people feel that their kids aren't getting ed educated. Yeah. Around this table here, we have board members. The majority of the board have kids in schools. Just so everyone knows that, we have board members that have kids in schools. I have over 25 years of children in the Madison School District, over 25 years. And so we're all concerned that uh, our kids get educated when they're sent to school. So no one has a monopoly on that. All of us are concerned about that. So my question is how do we get here? When, when, we, when they come before us and ask the question about 
We have people disrupting classes. For me, that's the number one issue because that's why people will leave our district. How can we allow anyone to disrupt the class? I would like to know what are we going to do about that, and then we'll open it up to the next questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start, and Alex, if you want to join in on that. Um, uh, James, we take this as seriously as anyone around this table does. Um, the board uh, uh, worked with us on the development of the behavior education plan. And every year, we've, we've learned from it and tried to make adjustments according, uh, accordingly, based on what we've learned about its effect, positive or negative, on student behavior. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack in, in terms of what's happening in our high schools. Um, I think that, and I've got a lot more thinking to do on this, um, I mean, I was alerted towards the end of last year from staff members at La Follette who wanted to meet with me about their concerns regarding behavior. Um, I sensed, um, walking away from that meeting, that the, the, the staff at La Follette was prepared to step up in whatever way, right, to make sure that expectations were consistent across the school, um, which is part of the PBIS framework. Um, uh, uh, so I don't think it's uh, necessarily been for lack of trying. I think there have been some driving forces that have made it more difficult for schools to do the kind of fundamentals of keeping the climate and culture strong. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, I think that uh, there, I think we need to do some serious work on the eighth to ninth grade transition. Um, uh, I think that um, we have not done a great job of uh, recognizing the, the, the students who are eighth graders headed into ninth grade that are the most high need and in the most need of support and making sure that, they're, um, that we're supporting them with their families and making the right decision about uh, where they should be going to high school and what supports they need in high school. So, I think there's something there about the 8th to ninth grade transition, and we have more uh, uh, ninth graders headed into our schools who need increasingly uh, increasing support, and we're trying to catch up with the challenge. I think that um, this issue about alternative settings is real. Um, as much as capital, and we'll talk about this more um, in the future as well, has, uh, I think, become stronger. I mean, capital High is graduating students at higher rates than they ever have. Um, I think there's something about the array of programs that we had before condensing them into capital. I think there were some unique options that were lost that were specially designed um, to support students, not just at the semester, but throughout the school year. So we've got, you remember hearing from Ricardo, we've got kids that are uh, kind of stuck waiting for those placements. I think we've got to work on that with urgency. Um, I think there are, uh, I think the society around us, I think Madison is changing, and that, and yes. that those needs are getting stronger. So I guess I'm saying, James, let me just finish the thought that, um, I, I, I get what everybody's saying about the BAP, and I think that there are um, uh, bigger structural issues that we can get after um, with some urgency um, related to some of the highest need students in our high schools um, that are making it difficult for the staff to focus their energy on the school as a whole. Um, I, so. Yeah. I, I um yeah, if we could just sort of stick to the, because the board members got questions they, they haven't even asked yet. So uh, you, you're answered like 25 questions right there. Um, for example, um, uh, we heard that when, when teachers call for help, they're not getting it. So can you just address that particular specific question? Uh, James, I'm going to try not to annoy you, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that because there are these big issues, that people's energy is drained because they're dealing with the smaller group of students whose needs aren't being met, which makes it hard for them to respond to the kind of regular day-to-day -day stuff. But Alex, you take it. Okay. Did you did you want to comment on that? I can if you like me to. Uh, go ahead, because Nikki is up next. The only thing I would I would add to it, Jen, is that I think um, 
with the increasing changes in, that are required of all of us, not just teachers, although they really are the front line, it is moving from a system that has, had been primarily reliant on removing the student from the space as, a, as, as almost the thing to do. It takes a lot of time. And I'm not saying it takes another five years, because that's unacceptable. Um, but to teach students beyond just rules, although rules are important, the common expectations for how a student conducts him or herself couched within a largest community setting, that kids are a part of that, um, and asking teachers and supporting teachers to actually teach content and this knowledge of skills, knowledge and dispositions, um, is, is taking longer than we anticipated. I'm just gonna be honest. Um, but we've seen evidence of where it's happening and where it's changing, and that does not minimize the high expectations that we, have to, we should have of every kid to meet the minimal expectations of being respectful, of being on time, um, uh, of, uh, of not fighting. Um, and for some students who actually need something different about how I learned that, um, it does not minimize the high demands and high expectations that we have of students. Um, and so when a student really does have behavior that's actually disrupting the classroom, um, there is a behavior response system that's supposed to get triggered. Um, and I've seen examples where it works perfectly, and I've seen examples where it falls apart. Um, and I think that happens sometimes, sometimes based on the day, uh, sometimes based on the, on the system itself. For a whole year, our schools were going through this process to evaluate how well, how effective is the system. And I'll say at La Follette, um, of all the schools, it took a lot longer to get that in play. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Nikki. You, my main issue is this, and I'm thanking Alex. I had to turn my mic on. Thank you, Alex, for stating what I consider obvious. 10, 20 years ago, kids with emotional disorders, behavior disorders, were forgotten. They were put in special classrooms. They were removed. They were suspended. They were expelled. We've had suspensions and expulsions go down. We're trying to educate every child. Is it going to be seamless? No. But I've seen what it's like the other way. I'm not encouraging the violence. But right now, we have teachers who are making sure a kid has enough to eat. We have teachers who are making sure they're available. We're worried about kids being late, and we're not asking whether or not they had food. We're not asking if they're going to be late because they're delivering the newspaper so they can afford the fa for their family. We're not asking any of those questions, and we're not asking the students directly of what they want and what they need, and I think that's part of it. But the other problem is with the hallways, yes, you need monitoring. I'm not saying that. But right now, there are two, number, there are two p things that cause people to get taken into the juvenile justice system in this city. Truancy and disorderly conduct. Both of them are primary of students of color or disabled individuals. And I'm sorry, I think not addressing it would make the problem worse. I'm not saying this is a racial issue. I am saying this is a human issue. We are going through economic changes and we are going through societal changes. But I want school to be a safe place for everyone. And I understand that. And yes, maybe we need to look at whether open lunch is the best. We need to look at who's at the doors. Absolutely. I want kids safe at school. But the one thing I don't want is this the us against them mentality. I've heard it from a lot, whether it be emails, people, parents, students, teachers of, well, if we got rid of those kids. I still don't understand what those kids mean. Maybe it's just me and my lack of education on the subject, but I don't know what a those kid is. I know what an individual is. And I believe that what we're doing is we're strengthening the partnerships we have. And the other issue, the only issue, the issue that I speak to on the BEP is very simple. When you have 70 pages of punishment and eight pages of interventions, we're not finding out why they're committing the acts. And maybe if we could find out why, we could end the problem instead of continuing to put them in the criminal justice system. Okay. Thank you, sorry for the sermon. It's okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Burks. Uh, difficult to follow, uh, Nikki. Um, very moving, and, and, and I agree with what she, what she, much of what she said. Um, I think like many of the board members at the table here, I'm kind of torn between uh, 
a whole lot of different issues that are on the table and are before us. The big issues, the issues coming out of Parkland, the issues of, uh, of, um, of immediate issues that will follow it, the larger issues of climate and, and morale and behavior within our district. And with the time we have today, we're, we're best to spend it. And um, as I sat here listening to Nikki and, and the others and, and your things, kind of there's a couple of kind of big things I want to talk about and try and talk about them incredibly briefly. And then I have two very specific questions about things related to La Follette. And, and so kind of just to, to, that's how I'm going to try to strike the balance. Um, first off, I appreciate Alex using, talking about emotional and physical safety. And I think that those are two things that connect all of these together is that physical safety and emotional safety are, 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 are things that we value. I value as a parent, I value as a school board member, and that they are, you can't have one without the other in, 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 in many ways. And we, and we must, you know, when we talk about safe um, and productive learning environments, that's a physical and an emotional uh, statement we're making, as well as a working environment for our teachers. Um, so I appreciate that very much. Um, I think that when we look at the bigger issues around the strategic, uh, or, I mean, around the uh, behavior education plan, you know, we have kind of three pieces here. We have a po set of policies, we have a plan to implement those policies, and we have staffing and budgetary um, pieces of that. I think that some of the fact that, that over the years the board has done our best, perhaps we could have done more to monitor and improve the implementation on this. I think this year we've dropped the ball to a great degree. Um, the last time the board, the plan was before us in, was when we had a uh, evaluation of it. After that evaluation, a three-year plan for implementation came out that the board has never discussed, never vetted as a board. That's on us. Um, that's what's in, the, in, in there, and I'm, and, and I'm looking at, and, and I hope we have an opportunity to do that. We have budget season coming up, and the staffing and the implementation plan, as we all know, are like that with each other, that they are intertwined. And I think that we need to be looking very, very closely at, um, you know, this is not the first year or the first time we have heard that help is called for and help doesn't come. Um, we have heard that ever since the BEP started. And so we shouldn't be surprised about that. And there are limitations, uh, limits on, on the resources we have. We can't have a whole room full of people waiting to go to respond to everything. But we do need to come to grips with what we can afford to do because this is crucial to, to, to what, we're, um, what we're doing. On um, two related things is that I think that uh, on the outside shooter kind of crisis training, I think we have to look very closely at, at the physical security issues, be it doors, exterior doors, cameras, interior doors. I also think we have to be very, very careful on, on, on what training um, we give and how we give it and who we give it to. And I, and I think that, and I look forward to hear recommendations coming back on those. Um, the two very specific questions are, one was that a parent reference, maybe two or three parents reference, um, issues that where uh, they were under the impression that the Board of Education policies or rules prevented the staff at, um, and particularly the, uh, particularly the principal at La Follette from implementing changes that they, um, we're recommending, and do you know what those changes are and what those policies or practices of the Board of Education might be that, that where we are being seen as an obstacle to doing what the staff on the ground at the Follett thinks should be done? Because I look at Principal Storch's recommendations here and I don't see anything here that violates anything the Board of Education has, has, has put in place. If, uh, and I guess that you know that, that if, if you can look into that and if any of the parents are involved who, who spoke to that could contact us and let us know if there were specific things because um, if we are being a hindrance, maybe we're being a hindrance for reasons that, that we think are good reasons, maybe we're not, but I'd like to, I'd like to know the specifics of it before, um, before we go forward. Uh, the second question is, 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 is again very specific, is about um, Alex referenced a pilot site for a new alternative program. And I guess that um, I could ask now for, you know, it, at this point it might just be very nebulous, um, but I, but I, so, you know, if you have any details or, or a vision for that that you could share now, that would be great. Otherwise, um, would appreciate being in the loop as that is designed and goes forward. Mm -hmm. um, I can say the one issue that came up tonight that I have to 
go back and we re re do some research is of the tardy policy. Yeah, that tardy policy uh, that did come up at the parent uh, meeting at La Follette. It came up again tonight. I think there is either some confusion um, about what the policy is, how it gets interpreted, and how it gets implemented. Um, because I, I want to be clear that a student in the, in the classroom for five minutes, uh, and that's acceptable as, as present, is that is, it's, still, it's still not acceptable. So I couldn't I find anything in our policy book that either. So that's, that's the one thing I just need to revisit. Basically. The only other two things that I could imagine is uh, what I've heard just about the BAP and uh, our classroom removals allowed at all, and the impression from parents that classroom removals are not allowed. I heard that at the meeting. Tuesday night, um, and of course, feedback on uh, expulsion. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Burke. Uh, I, I know that everyone here cares just as deeply as I do about the safety of our students. I don't question that for a moment, and I know that you work hard every single day to do that but I think we have to draw the line in the sand somewhere and just say certain things are unacceptable guns in our schools in the hands of students I think is unacceptable and we figure out how what we are going to need to do to prevent it metal detectors, whatever. But I think we just have to say certain things are just not going to be allowed. And I would say students bringing guns into our schools should not be allowed. Students coming back into the schools after a violation through due process need to be so closely monitored to ensure the safety of students. And I would say the third is disruptions in the classroom. Students can't learn, teachers can't teach with the level of disruption that I know is happening in our high schools. And whether it's changes in the BEP, whether it's alternative education settings, I'm not saying we throw the kids out. No, it's our job but we better figure out what it's going to take. I'm not here, I'm not ans asking for answers. I know these are difficult issues, but I think we have to have the answers and we have to have them rapidly and we need to act on them. Okay, Dean. Again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, some of these things are more complicated than others. There are some that suggest fairly quick resolution. Joe, you mentioned uh, environmental concerns around the common area. Uh, I did a little security work in my life, and I know that there are things you can do like that. How, how close are you to coming up with some, gest some suggestions for La Follette changing the, uh, the, the structure of the commons? And then the other thing that seems like a really quickly easy fix is uh, the doors, monitoring in and out of the doors. Uh, that happens over 100 times a day, where just someone's letting somebody come in and out. We don't know what, what they're doing, what they're bringing out in. So th those are really easy things to fix, I think. And, and if we can't fix the door, the door issue by the end of the week, uh, that's, you know, then it should be by Monday. So th that's an easy fix that I think we can do. So can you speak to, have, can you speak to something more specific around those two specific areas? Or maybe not you, but someone who's talked with Sean and what's the plan for the common? Uh, and then what can we do about the doors immediately? What are those two things we can do? Well, I can say that, re reference the comments, I've just had some preliminary conversations with Sean, and I've also spoke with Chad Weesey uh, about the idea, too, and they think it's, uh, quite honestly, Sean, Sean had, he was intrigued by some of the thoughts that we had, but then I, we got more intrigued as we, more we talked about it, about how we could involve, create a process 
involving students, involving others, to think about what we might do with that space. So I, I would say, Dean, we're just at kind of at the beginning of that conversation, um, but I do think it's promising. Um, in regards to the doors, um, I can start right away, obviously, with, this, uh, with our security assistants and our team over there um, and get a better handle uh, of what that is. I think Sean said, I believe they got 17 doors uh, in La Folla. It's a huge campus. Um, and, uh, it, but it also gets to this mindset around safety. Um, and how many kids we got at La Folla? 1,500? Yes. You know, it, it, we, we have to get 1,500 kids to understand that from this time to this time, those other doors are all locked, and this is the only door you come in and out. That's it. And if somebody else is standing there, they need to go around and come through the welcome center. You don't pound the door just because they're out by the flagpole and let them in. And um, so it's, it, you said some of these issues, are, they seem easy, but oftentimes uh, changing culture is a difficult thing to do. Um, but we got to be up to the task, um, and right now we need to double down all we can um, at La Follette to try to get um, kids, staff, everybody, my security assistants on board. Uh, thank you for your presentation tonight um, and I mean I, I guess I kind of want to echo some of what both Mary and TJ have said um, everybody in the room here tonight wants a safe and secure and welcoming learning environment for children in our district and um, and that's our job to make sure it's happening and it's not happening right now in all of our schools in varying degrees right from the classroom disruption to more significant kind of potential concerns right um, I'm not going to talk about the BEP tonight we have time Monday next week to talk about that I do think we need to make changes both to policy and practice and potentially resourcing there um, but I'm going to hold my comments for that that dialogue um, on the safety and security kind of d discussion I guess that we've opened tonight in large parts in response to some of both Madison as well as national um, dialogue I guess I've I have three um, things to just kind of dive into and the big request would be to get from you a, a much more comprehensive review of our facilities and procedures as they relate to safety and security um, in the next before the end of the school year for sure and uh, I would hope sooner than that um, so uh, the first to dive into would be facilities look we've heard a lot of good recommendations from the community from you I know that you're working on many of these um, but internal doors uh, external doors security cameras welcome centers right I'd love to see a pretty thorough review of what your perspective is on what's needed there um, this is table stakes right this is the stuff we can do uh, and if we can do anything at all with facilities to make our school safer we need to do it um, full stop and if that requires extra funding then let's have that conversation I don't want you to hold back what's possible right I want us to make those choices and those are choices that that we need to have a discussion about um, but please bring your expertise and share with us what you what your guidance would be what is best practice right now end to end for facilities for safety and security so that's that's one um, evacuation routes is another one just out there the second on procedures I guess kind of the same question right this one starts to get broader um, but evacuation procedures code red procedures um, entrance and exit all of that jazz um, cell phones I'd like again your perspective on how that influences some of the um, fights that we're seeing um, in schools and how alternative procedures might impact that positively or negatively uh, so that's sort of procedures and then the last is on prevention um, again kind of what are some of the choices and I think we've got some of them laid out already that we're going to talk about um, mental health uh, certainly kind of staff uh, in the in the buildings um, alternative programs curriculum right I mean it's our job to have curricula that kids want to sit in rooms and learn um, so that one again I'm kind of going narrow to broader but point being would love your perspective on what's a comprehensive safety and security kind of update for our district our kids deserve to have the best of um, what's known to keep everybody safe right now so um, 
maybe that's that's kind of a long list. Sorry, but I, I know you're working on all of this already. I just for the and public want to make sure that at enlisting some ass assistance in getting this done too. Great. Yeah. Do you have any idea on when you might be able to have a we much can't. more thorough? We're, we're having you, that conversation right now, and we have a new risk management person involved here at the district that um, Karen is coordinating weekly meetings with, and so we're trying to put together a team here um, to go about this yeah. in a comprehensive way. Um, we really, it's overdue, we need to do it. I, I agree, it's overdue, we need to do it, and don't hold back from if it's fixing security cameras right now that we know have been broken for six months, right. just do it, well, right? I mean, well, I think there's there's that line of... Just the whole DVR-based system that we're on right now, we need to be looking at long-term creating more of a central server-based operation, because these DVRs... Um, What's a DVR? DV, the d d Digital DVR DVR devices okay. that okay. Are, are... Thank you. And basically, we just need to look Sorry. at the whole camera system in terms of the infrastructure and the architecture of the system right now. Joe Anderson um, has been amazing. Uh, uh, MMSD employee for many, many years. Um, him and about six technicians support our current system today. We have approximately 900 cameras um, in operation in 40 plus different buildings. Um, but uh, we need to be looking towards the next generation of technology. Yes. Um, but when it comes to that stuff, and this is a great time to have that conversation. Great. All right, thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. Anna? Sure, thank you for sharing the updated information tonight around school security and what we have in place and areas that we need to improve upon. I agree it would be helpful to get a security evaluation update of where we're at with things. Um, and generally, I would just say around prevention, I think one thing um, around school safety for, for, I would say, students that are involved in unsafe behavior in our schools and in our community, one thing that we find is many times it's due to a lack of connection and a lack of feeling valued in their space and therefore they engage in unsafe behaviors. Um, and so I hope that gets explored, um, that why you know we might possibly have students that don't feel connected to their school community and what's going into that. The other thing too I would say definitely look at, I think the earlier you start <coughs> engaging with students and identifying kids that may be more likely to be disconnected, it's less likely we'll get to ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Okay. I mean, I think this is something we need to go back to right. fifth, sixth, seventh, because that's where we're starting to see behaviors and trends yep. and really addressing it early on because it's really difficult to recapture those kids later on in life. Yeah. Um, and just looking at that and also too around a piece of, I work with a lot of students that aren't being su successful in the district right now. And one thing I find in my experience is a lot of times there aren't places for the, the students to go. They don't meet the requirements for any of the programs that we offer, and it really just becomes difficult for them, which kind of adds to their already feeling disconnected and then actually saying, we have no place for you in our district. So when we look at, if we look at alternative programs, I really want to be mindful about when you put criteria and eligibility on it to make it accessible to our students that aren't being successful in our high school and our other alternative <coughs> programs. Um, because it is a challenge to find places for some of our kids to access an education. So, okay, uh, we're not going around the table again. We're going to be closing this out. I'm going to allow yes. Nikki last comments here. Uh, it's time to move on. So, Nikki, you'll get last comments on this topic. My uh, last comment is just on the alternative education program. Not against, but I do caution one thing. I don't want it to be used as a catch-all. I don't want this to be used as a witch hunt and an excuse to put more children with who are minorities, more kids with disabilities, into an alternative program out of sight, out of mind. I think that it only make the problem worse by moving it down the road. Okay. Um, you know, I guess the final, my final comment is that uh, <coughs> Hearing from the audience today, it sounds like they're interested in you know what we're going to do about their problems yesterday. Some of the things we're talking about here are long-term things. So I think everyone understands that some things are long-term, some solutions are long-term. But whatever could be done yesterday for the fall, it needs to get done. Yep. And uh, this is a two-track problem. There's some issues on the table that needs to get resolved right away. And if everything is long term, I can't imagine that body of parents and staff over there being happy with it. 
from yeah. what we've heard. So those are my final comments. Uh, Dr. Cheatham, do you have any final comments? I do appreciate uh, all the work that you all have done and, and your presentations here today. Uh, do you have any final comments on this subject? No, just thank the board for this dialogue. Thank the team for uh, speaking tonight. Um, and we will act with urgency. Um, the steps that are outlined for Laval specifically, um, those aren't steps that we just put on paper to write them. Um, we are following through on them as we speak. Um, and I uh, expect that we'll be able to report back to you that we followed through on those in the coming weeks. Um, and, um, and thank you for the overall safety and security comments because those are important as well. And uh, thankful that we've got Joe and Karen on the case. Um, uh, keeping our schools safe, but making them even safer um, for, from potential threats. So thank you. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. you all. Thanks. Okay, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I'll move that the Board of Education adopt and approve all the motions set forth in the section six of the electronic agenda prepared for the February 26, 2018 regular school board meeting. Exactly as said, motions are written. By voting firmly on the motion, a board member expresses his or her informative vote on each of the motions consolidated hereby, subject to any express separations that have been made by any member of the school board. Second. It's been moved and second. Um, okay, separations. Uh, I'd like to separate 6.19, the Joyce Foundation grant. 6.19. 6.19. 6.19. Any others? Okay, Lori, advisory vote, please. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries 7 0, 6.19. Uh, I'm not going to make an effort to have anyone, convince anyone else to vote against this, but I will be voting against this. Um, not because I don't appreciate the generosity of the Joyce Foundation, not because I don't um, understand the value of the work and the value of this funding for the work going on in our district, but there has been a lack of transparency around um, the previous Joyce Foundation grant and this Joyce Foundation grant where we have two different fiscal agents involved and the money nor the paperwork is not coming directly to our district. Um, in the past, we've had contradictory answers about what it can and can't be used from. Be prior to this vote, I tried to get some clarity on that and got confusion. I finally was able to, was given a copy of the grant application which included no budget information in it. And um, I appreciate the effort to get the information to me, but a grant application without any budget information does not create the kind of transparency um, I, as a board member, desire and our community deserves, so I will be voting against it. Okay. Any other comments or questions about 6.19? Okay. Seeing none, I'll move that the Board of Education accept a grant through the Foundation for Madison Public Schools in the amount of $300,000 to support MMSD personalized pathways planning and implementation. Second. It's been moved and second. Any f other comments or questions? Seeing none, Lori, advisory vote, please. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Nay. Motion carries 6 1. Okay, that concludes our consent agenda items for tonight. And uh, next item on the agenda would be uh, instruction work group. Um, we met on February 5th, 2018. Uh, we discussed the at-risk opportunity youth proposals, planning, research work that have been going forward, um, which has been referenced multiple times tonight. Uh, I believe that some of that will come back to us in a more formal sense. I'm not quite sure when and where, but for those of you who weren't following along, opportunity youth refers to those students who either um, have dropped out or at risk of dropping out and um, elsewhere uh, often referred to as disconnected youth and, and uh, this is some research about some ideas of what we could be doing better there. Um, the next item we discussed were the core values, goals and metrics for the next strategic framework and that appears later on the agenda so I will pass right by that. 
Um, and uh, we will meet next on March 5th. The proposed agenda items for that meeting are middle school start times and the middle school model. So it's middle school night at the uh, instruction work group. Thank you, Mr. Bur Mr. Uh, Mertz. Is there any, uh, yeah, you, it's, yeah, it's been that type of evening. So any questions for TJ? All right, seeing none, next item on the agenda, operations work group, Ms. Burke. We held a meeting on February 19th. The first topic was a budget, uh, and that will be the topic for the next meeting on March 12th as well. Uh, I'm gonna go move right into the employee handbook update. This is uh, uh, a topic that came through and was discussed at the work group. It is uh, recommended that the Board of Education adopt the modifications to the MMSD employee handbook as set forth in the materials prepared for the February 26, 2018 regular meeting with the modifications marked with an asterisk to take effect immediately. Is there a motion? Second. Did you, you made the motion. Uh, I said it's recommended. Oh. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? Mm -hmm. um, I looked and did not see any information concerning the uh, issue brought up by custodial staff about, um, about credit for time in, as employees <coughs> when they change units. And we requested information about the number of people and the cost for that. And I do, did not see any in the weekly update or attached to the agenda. <laughs> Um, is, this, is this ringing a bell anywhere? Yes, I didn't see it either, and I was looking for it as well. Um, can Heidi approach, James? Heidi, Would that be all right? Heidi please Heidi, approach. Can you come on up? Um, so I did ask our staff to pull together that information and I got that today. And there are 10 individuals who this would be applicable to. And the cost would be approximately, and this is just on base salary, not overtime or anything like that, um, 28,000 for just the salary and with the roll-ups that's another four. So around 31. Okay. And no change in this area has been made to the proposal since we saw it in operations work group. Correct. Okay. Um, thank you. Laura, your advisory vote. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. That passes 5-2. Okay, the next item that we covered also has uh, two board approvals, and it is with regards to proposed land attachments and detachments. And uh, I will move that the Board of Education approve a resolution detaching territory from the MMSD, parentheses, Homewood Suites, and attaching to the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute, 117.13 as provided in the document prepared for this agenda item dated February 26, 2018. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Laura, your advisory vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7-0. Uh, I move that the Board of Education approve a resolution detaching territory from the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District, in parentheses Oak Brook, and attaching to the MMSD, to the MMSD pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute Section 117.12, as provided in the document prepared for this agenda item dated February 26, 2018. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Laura? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7-0. And as I mentioned before, our next meeting is March 12th, 
and uh, it is once again the 2018-19 budget, uh, specifically compensation and priority actions. All right, thank you, Ms. Burke. Um, next item on the agenda, other reports to the board, City of Madison Education Committee. Yes, this was an interesting um, meeting. We went through the uh, chair's report. We followed up on the letter from both um, Paul Soglin and uh, Jennifer Cheatham. We, uh, we agreed that um, we will focus on three areas as long as we could also discuss other areas. We were uh, assured by both staff from the mayor, Gloria Reyes, and staff from MMSD, Nichelle Nichols, that that was appropriate as well. And we worked on priorities for the committee. Thank you, any questions for Nikki? Seeing none, thank you, Nikki. Uh, next item, Student Senate. Uh, last week we talked about how teachers uh, can support tier one and tier two interventions with the advanced learning plan um, and ended up talking about how ACP would need to be majorly repurposed if it was to be any type of resource in the new advanced learning plan. All right, thank you. Any questions for Laura? Okay, seeing none, uh, education resource officers. Sure, we met last week, and if you have an opportunity to uh, look through the second attachment, what you're seeing there is every recommendation or thought that people brought to us throughout our time, and uh, uh, the next uh, Role assignment for the committees to go through all those and put them in, uh, put them together to a in a report that we'll bring to you, and there are about 144 of them, and I'm not sure um, uh, there may be more, but all of those won't be coming to you. Uh, some of those were taken out, and we're going to finish we're heading towards finishing this group, and it's about and I think it's the timing is right, so in about. Uh, uh, I think we'll be able to reach our goal of getting a report here by May. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Merckx? Yeah, I wish the parents and the news media who um, were earlier were still here because there's a lot of misimpressions uh, about the work of this committee and where our district is with EROs that I'd like to very, very briefly um, correct a little bit of. Uh, as Dean said, the 144 plus recommendations are pretty much anything any, anyone whispered in our direction at any time and, it, and, and they're relatively comprehensive and this committee has been working hard and studying and will come up with recommendations um, at some point which, the, which, which are about improving um, how police are in our schools. And uh, I also want to very, very much praise and thank the dedicated citizen members of this committee in a, in a very public fashion. Um, they took on a difficult task. The task has been made more difficult by the increased scrutiny and pressures that have come. Uh, they have been working hard. They have been working smart. They are um, they're good people and, I'm, and, and, and we selected well and I'm proud to be serving with them. And the work of this committee is good and this board will have a chance to review it when it's finished. But let us finish, please. Yeah, I would also add that the, two, the, the staff that we had helping us also worked very, very hard and did great work. And uh, they needed to, they should be acknowledged as well. So we're, we're getting close to, uh, you know, drawn, the end of the circle and uh, it should be soon and then it'll be our job to figure out what to do all right thank you any questions for mr lomas okay seeing none then uh, that concludes our um, reports from various uh, committees the next item on the agenda then is other business and uh, i'm gonna go ahead and make the motion and all so then we can get right into it Um, is that me weird, sounding like? There's a weird hum. No, there's a hum. It's not me. I don't know. What. Oh, it's, it's Mary. <laughs> it's Mary. <laughs> okay, I move that the Board of Education. I move. Yeah, I move that the Board of Education adopt the vision, core value statements, three goals, and 21 metrics for the next strategic framework as set forth in the materials prepared for the February 26, 
2018 regular meeting. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Questions or comments? Mr. Mertz. Safety and behavior. So uh, I don't have, you know, I don't have a vision of what it looks like, but I, I, I think it's all on the Second. Okay, we have a, a, a motion amendment of uh, placeholder for safety on the table, and uh, it's been seconded. Any other comments on this uh, amendment? I would support that. Yeah, I, I would as well. Okay. I would. Um I would support as long as it's not based on suspension and expulsion data yes. or yeah. or disability we'll, or behavior caused we'll, we'll, that we'll I identify. That yeah, we'll, we'll, Sorry. We'll, yeah, we'll get into the details. Right now we're just talking about a placeholder for uh, a yeah. safety <laughs> placeholder. And uh, it sounds like the majority of the board is, is a, in a, uh, favor of, of the safety placeholder. Uh, yeah. Superintendent Chief, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, I was just going to say that I did have that discussion with Bo earlier today, knowing that TJ had forwarded uh, that question. Um, I know the board did discuss whether or not we should have a safety or discipline related uh, metric for the. Um, I, was, I know that that was discussed several weeks ago. Um, I do recall the general conversation at that point. I realized context changes, and we're three weeks later, and that was three weeks ago. Um, that at that point, uh, just to support Nikki's comment, that uh, using something like out of school suspensions was not something that the board generally supported. That said, um, if we did something like a power question on safety, mm -hmm. um, that could be analyzed along the lines of teachers staff, parents, and students, that, that might be one way to get at the issue that would be consistent with the rest of the metrics. Okay. Um, okay, before we move on voting on the amendment, um, Jen, could you clarify for the board, just so the board knows exactly what we're voting on, uh, could you make sure that the board is on the same page on that? Thanks, in terms James. of not the necessarily the amendment, but what the we're voting on the goals and not so much the metric that. Uh, yeah, let me clarify. Please clarify. Um, you're voting on the vision statement. You're voting on the core values statements. Um, you're voting on the three goals um, that are in blue in that document, and you're voting on the twenty-one possibly 22 <laughs> metrics um, that are in red. Um, and, and that's my summary. Okay. Just to further, just to further clarify that uh, some of the metrics are kind of t in a TBA. Um, sorry, detail, are details are, are yet to yeah. be. And, and, and so that's, I mean, the, the, the metrics num themselves the are there, but how they will be measured isn't. And, and just I think that James was trying to communicate 
what we are passing tonight and what work is still left to be done. True, the ways we measure yeah, so. um, would, is not something the board is voting on. Okay, so. I just, I just had a question. Um, I know when we were discussing this that initially there had been a goal in there around access to a well-rounded yeah. education. So can you speak a little bit to where that will be captured if it's not captured in the strategic framework? I will, Anna. Thank you for the question. It's a really important one. Um, I think you all know that the original framework, the framework that we're still completing, had a goal uh, all around, uh, ensuring access to a well-rounded and challenging curriculum. And uh, it proved to be difficult to measure and uh, with a somewhat imperfect set of metrics. Um, what we, in this proposal, the place where it could potentially be most and best captured is in number seven the percent of students on track to achieve the graduate vision. And as you know, the graduate vision um, is, uh, is well-rounded. So uh, depending on the survey questions that we devise, um, we're hoping that we can get a sense from students about the extent to which their experience is both well-rounded and challenging. So I think that's where we're trying to get at it, Anna. Real quick. Sure. Goal three, number 18, that's the right correction. There was a word change in the yeah. year. Yeah. Let's just confirm that so I, I can't remember. That's correct. Um, participation rate is that's the correct the right word. One. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we have an amendment to this motion. And um, second that. And it's been seconded. So do we have to vote, we have to vote on this amendment first. So um, I'll move that the Board of Education adopt the, let me give a shout out to this, the vision core various statements, three goals and 20 metrics for the, and a placeholder for the next strategic framework that's set forth in the materials prepared for the February 26, 2018 regular meeting. And the placeholder on safety metric? Placeholder on safety. You said behavior and safety. Had 22 metrics. That's what really what we're doing, yep. change 21 to 22. Okay. And then I think that simplifies things. I, I, think, I, th I think the board wants to go on record that this, is con that this metric concerns safety, behavior Be and safety. Behavior and safety. Behavior and safety. Behavior and safety. I, th I think that we want to go on record with that. So, um, so I know as, I as I stated. So, <laughs> okay, as stated. So, Laura, your advisor vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Okay, motion carries 7 0. And uh, so now the main motion would be that the Board of Education adopt the vision core value statements. I think we, I think we, 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 we did, did, we did, did a, 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 a substitute main motion, is what we substitute did. Main, yeah, yeah. That's okay, right. that's so we're we good. Did. Yeah, it's, it's not even 9 o'clock, James. <laughs> <laughs> that deserves an, a round of applause, in my opinion. I've got to tell you. Thank you. I thought maybe we would add the 22 metrics in with our, with our uh, safety placeholder. So, well, we, we're not done yet. There must be some new business that you all want to bring before this board tonight. So, uh, is there any old or new business to be brought before the board tonight? Then, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Do I get a second? Second. Lori, advisory vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're adjourned.